Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Ethan Budiansky, Director of Environment at the World Cocoa Foundation. And I have a very big pleasure of, of welcoming you to this panel conversation on prosperous farmers and a healthy planet through agroforestry. I'll be moderating this session today and I look forward to a very interesting dialogue. Let's jump right to um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do have French interpretation for this session. Um, if you would like it, it will be at the bottom right-hand corner of your Zoom meeting. You can open that up and select either English or French. We ask that throughout this conversation, throughout this session, that everybody is to remain muted. Um, we will, we welcome your questions and we look forward to your questions. We are going to handle that via the chat function. Um, you will find in the chat function that there is a specific chat dedicated to ask your questions here. Please ask your questions directly into that chat function throughout the session. We will be we will be compiling them. They'll be fed to to me so that I can then ask our panelists. Please do not ask questions in any other platform because we might miss them. So please just ask your questions through ask your questions here. Um, and just to let you know that the. French interpretation is being set up um, uh, and, and it should be functioning in just a minute. Um, towards the end of this, then we will invite you to open up your video so that we can see everybody. But for right now, in order to um, minimize distraction and, and minimize um, any bandwidth issues, we'll ask everyone to keep their videos closed. And obviously, thank you to all of our sponsors for making this session and the partnership meeting successful. So let's jump to it. Beginning in 2017, the governments of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and leading cocoa and chocolate companies, 37 at this point, joined together in the Cocoa and Forest Initiative to end deforestation, forest degradation, and restore forest areas. Industry and government have made key commitments around forest protection and restoration, improving farmers' livelihoods and sustainable cocoa production, growing more cocoa on less land, and ensuring greater social inclusion. In order to achieve some of these cocoa and forest initiative commitments, companies and governments are making significant investments in the promotion of cocoa agroforestry. Since 2018, Companies have distributed over 4 million multipurpose trees in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana for the promotion of cocoa agroforestry. So agroforestry is widely recognized as a strategy, as a system that has the potential to deliver a range of economic, agricultural, environmental, and climatic benefits. However, can agroforestry deliver all of these outcomes at the same time? Are there designs, systems that can deliver on this based on farmers' unique context and at scale. Achieving all of these benefits require a review of scientific evidence and field experience to apply approaches that have been proven to work, coupled with careful planning, preparation, and farmer participation. So through this session, WCF will review multiple perspectives to examine the questions above and to understand what a successful agroforestry model is and the kind of interventions that need to be in place for an agroforestry model to be adopted and scaled sustainably. Now, in order to have this dialogue, we have a very diverse panel of experts. I'll introduce myself once again. I'm Ethan Budiansky. I'm the Director of Environment at the World Cocoa Foundation, and I'll be moder mod moderating the, the session today. Um, we've got the technical expert perspective coming from Valentina Robiglio, from, um, who's a senior land use system scientist at 
um, World Agroforestry, ICRAP. We have Johan Fare, who is a, um, the Sustainability and Social Impact Manager at Kinome. We also have, um, from the private sector perspective, from a CFI signatory company who is, in, who is investing significantly in, in, in cocoa agroforestry. And that is Sebastian um, Venterhoek, who is a forest advisor at Cargill. And then we've got the perspective on sustainable finance to scale cocoa agroforestry. Andrian Grimard, ESG and Impact Director Canada at Ecotierra. Once again, throughout this dialogue, please be submitting your questions to ask your questions here. Now, to start the dialogue, we want to get a we want to have a better understanding of the benefits of a cocoa agroforestry system compared to cocoa monocultures. For this, I would like to introduce and invite Vivka Netter, research, researcher at the University of Giessen, and Joanna Jacobi, senior research scientist at the Center for Development and Environment, to present on the recently published study, Cocoa Agroforestry Systems versus Monoculture in multi-dimensional meta-analysis. So over to the two of you, thank you. Thank you, Ethan, for this introduction. And uh, me and my colleague, uh, Johanna, we want to share our last, uh, our latest um, research. We published a multi-dimensional meta-analysis. Next slide, please. And in this meta-analysis, we were comparing the performance of agroforestry systems with cacao and monocultures. Next slide. For this meta-analysis, we did a huge literature, literature search on cocoa agroforestry, and we found a lot of published uh, articles uh, that present research on cocoa agroforestry, but we were looking especially for um, studies that compared agroforestry systems and monocultures, found 52 studies that we could use with 144 sub-studies. And finally, by com combining some of the studies, we've got 93 data pairs with independent pairwise comparisons. Next slide. And as I said, it's a multi-dimensional meta-analysis. We were looking on a lot of different parameters out of this. Um, one big part is of course the yield. And here we were not only looking on the cocoa yield, but also on the total system yield. And uh, of course, one part is economy with some parameters we are looking here, like costs, revenue, net present value. Um, we were looking on soil properties in the chemical way and in a physical way. Uh, we were looking for pests and diseases in cocoa agroforestry and monocultures, on the microclimate in the systems, on stand structural parameters that define these systems, and on biodiversity. Next slide, please. For our results, first the yield. Um, we looked at the cocoa yield and uh, on the left side of the, of the, the zero bar, uh, you can see higher yields were achieved in monocultures. But we were looking also on the system yield, looking what all the crops that you can harvest and also the, for the timber. And here we found a huge bigger value in the agroforestry systems on the right side of the vertical bar. So higher system yield in agroforestry systems. Next slide, please. Um, here we show always to wrap up um, a bit higher yield in the monoculture, but a huge higher yield, a total system yield in the agroforestry systems. Next slide. On the economic performance, as I said, we were looking for the costs for the system revenue and the net present values. And for all of them, for all of these parameters, we could not find a significant difference in between monocultures and agroforestry systems. That was related to um, 
the different points, how different studies were looking on these different parameters. But um, yeah, I think it's a good to see that these differences were not significant in the final analysis. Next slide, please. So no difference in the economy. Um, for the soil properties, we were um, looking for different parameters like uh, the main nutrients in the soil and uh, physical properties like bulk density and uh, water, uh, water content of the soil. And at all, we did not find differences in between agroforestry systems and monocultures, surprisingly, but um, has to be uh, read in our publication. For the pests and diseases, the um, analysis were interesting because there are some pests that are more prevalent in agroforestry systems and others in monocultures. So the, the view you can't take all the pests and diseases together, but have to look very separately on the performance on, of the single pests and diseases. And here we got mostly data from fungal diseases. The microclimatic, um, the microclimate showed better values in the agroforestry system when looking on the level of the cocoa um, below the shade tree canopy. We found a buffering of temperature, of the mean temperature, but also of uh, temperature extremes like high temperature and lower temperature, showing a climate buffering within the agroforestry systems. So uh, good news. Um, under the viewpoint of climate change. And also the carbon sequestration was of course much higher in the agroforestry system. We were looking on living carbon in the stems, but also in a combination with the below ground carbon in the roots of the trees and cocoa altogether. Next slide, please. One result I want to share with you is the biodiversity. We were looking on different um, species because uh, some studies are looking for ants, other for birds, other for frogs, termites, midges, and uh, in conclusion all of them show higher values in the agroforestry systems indicated here on the right side of the zero bar and uh, this is shown in higher species number in agroforestry system. Next slide please. So here to complete our, uh, our slide, the biodiversity high on agroforestry systems. Next slide. And uh, as a general conclusion from our study, we see agroforestry systems have the potential to compete with and even outperform monocultures in the most important parameters. And with this, I like to give to my, uh, to hand over to my colleague, Johanna. Next slide, please. Yeah, I see our time is almost over. I'll try to be quick. So we found also that there is no general definition of cocoa agroforestry beyond the inclusion of trees and cocoa plots. And we also think that such a global definition would not be accurate because of the high heterogeneity of environmental and climatic and soil uh, conditions and so on. But what is really important is to take into account local and context specific knowledge and recommendations for cocoa agroforestry. Uh, that are coming from the specific context to, to find an adequate designs. And also there's a huge knowledge gap on species specific information on shade trees, on management and pricing policies and livelihood aspects that need to be addressed. Next, please. So that also means, uh, well, simple agroforestry systems can have positive effects already, but they are not enough because the equation needs to contain food security, for instance, or also environmental benefits uh, that go beyond just uh, timber or shade. So we really need a social ecological system approach uh, to better understand what the best agroforestry system is for cocoa. Next, please. So we also found that management is more decisive for cocoa yield than uh, if it's growing in monocultural agroforestry, but then management for many means uh, application of pesticides, many of which are highly hazardous. And so we like to recommend this uh, new publication that says that hand pollination influences more than pesticides or fertilizers. Next, please. 
So then also uh, building and enabling access to new alternative markets for all those agroforestry pro products is crucial and real incentives for farmers to plant trees. Distribution of plants is definitely not enough. Next, please. And then agroforestry is also different from deforestation free, as we've also heard from the cocoa barometer news. So agroforestry is very good for the restoration of degraded areas. That's kind of what's, what many see as its future, not on, on deforested areas there. It's not really obvious. So thank you very much. Those are our results. Thank you, John and Vipka. That was great. Um, let, me, let me just ask one quick follow-up question. Since you've done this meta-analysis, you've, you've looked into a lot of the research on cocoa agroforestry that's out there. What are maybe the three or five key knowledge gaps that you have seen to, to, to inform practitioners, industry, government to better um, implement cocoa agroforestry systems? What are those key studies that you see need to, need to happen in the near future? Okay, I think I can answer first. Um, what is obvious is that agroforestry is not a simple system. Agroforestry is complex and also the term agroforestry is complex. What is it? Um, agroforestry can be a monospecific shade, but it can be a highly diverse system with different strata. And so it's very, very uh, difficult to, to give just one recommendation. What we see at all, that management, as Johanna just said, is very important, um, difficult sometimes because it has to be adopted to the specific system. But this is the key, I think, to improve and um, to go on with good agroforestry systems. Okay, great. And Joanna, anything to add in terms of key research questions you feel are missing at this point? Yes, I think the questions of what diversity we need in agroforestry systems, what works, what is really interesting is, for example, approaches to dynamic agroforestry that takes into account the natural succession of species that has a huge influence on how the system develops on the yield, um, closing the hunger gap that farmers tend to have when they uh, when they plant cocoa and have to wait for years for the first harvest, if they plant an intelligent system, then they don't have this hunger gap. So those are questions. What plants really work together? How do you design a functioning dynamic agroforestry system that not only uh, has all these uh, environmental benefits, but also economic benefits to the families? Th those are things that are totally under-researched in my view. And also local knowledge on species, on trees, trees that dry out the systems, trees that bring moisture to the systems and so on. There's a huge knowledge base, traditional knowledge and agroforestry in many parts of the world is just a traditional system. So this needs to be rescued and documented, analyzed, brought together with modern knowledge, scientific knowledge. So those are things that are, I don't think there's too much research on that yet. Awesome. Thank you both very much. We'll be coming back to you with any questions um, towards the end of this session. Um, I think this flows very well into our next um, panelist, um, uh, Valentina from, from ICRAP. Now, Valentina, just playing off exactly what, what they were just talking about, one of the key conclusions of their study was to refrain from developing global recommendations for agro, agroforestry. Rather, it encourages local and context-specific recommendations for cocoa agroforestry design and management considering social economic factors should be developed for the implementation of sustainable and feasible cocoa production systems. Can you therefore elaborate further on the variety and complexity of cocoa agroforestry systems from your experience on the ground? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ethan, and thank you for the interesting presentation and for the <clears throat> opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm Valentina Robiglio. I work for ECRAF and I'm based in uh, Lima, Peru. Um, so I think that uh, you're right, it fits very well with uh, what I'm going to say. There are basically five key points I, I'm, I want to talk about. 
So the first one is it's confirmed agroforestry has the potential to deliver on multiple outcomes at the same time. So I think that's that's very important to, to say that because it has not necessarily stressed enough in the general debate and, and there is evidence for that, that's important. However, there are no silver bullets. So what counts is the interplay between farmers' objectives, capacities and skills the socio-ecological context in which they operate. That includes market, institution, regulation, access to knowledge and technology, beside obviously the biophysical factors that make that the implementation of a certain practice, for example, the integration of a given species is necessary, is suitable or harmful for the crop and for the system. The type of trade-offs that farmers face vary at the fine scale, vary by site and by farmer, depending on household livelihoods and goals. And the factors of adoption also vary at the fine scale, depending on accessibility to services, to market knowledge. And this might be determined by regulation, whether or not the farmer is part of an organization. So there is not one size fits all. And when you ask me to present a model that works and illustrate why it works and how to scale it, I was in trouble. So, because basically lots of the farms I visited and farmers I met, they were all for one reason or another valuable. So for the purpose of this panel, what I made was to build a simple performance matrix that is based on a cool tool that we developed at Picraft called PlantSelf that will allow me to present four different cases. I will briefly illustrate the first case and then refer to the others in comparison to this one. Here we are in Talamanca Indigenous Reserve, Costa Rica. We are in a 30 years old 1.5 hectare plantation that belongs to an indigenous smallholder farmer and that was established on a plot originally slash and burn for corn and rice. Spacing is four by four, shaded originally by planted ingas, inga and bananas plantain and progressively replaced by planted fruit trees for palmito, avocado and citrus naturally and naturally regenerated laurel. So in terms of performance, productivity of the main crop is low. However, the annual increment in total stem volume of the timber species is high as significant and high is fruit production that is fundamental for food security and sales of surpluses. In terms of ecosystem services, conservation value of this system are intermediate, carbon high, nutrient cycling to be improved. In terms of requirement, and I think that's very important for scaling, uh, they are high in terms of labor and knowledge, and in particular for the silvicultural component and the design of shade that can be very sophisticated. In any case, the farmer is happy and it seems that the system meets his livelihood's objective, in particular in terms of diversification. A different case is the one of the farmer in Pará, Brazil, that manages a system with five commercial species, including acai, pepper, and jiroba, taparibá. The farmer is part of a very strong cooperative that supports its access to multiple markets for the various products. The farmer has maintained some native species and makes significant use of fer fertilizer species such as lucuna, cayanus, inga, liricidia, all over the life of the system. So scores are relatively high, including requirements in terms of labor and knowledge that again are very sophisticated. Different is the case of Peru, where the farmer is an entrepreneur managing several hectares of cacao, investing in labor and technology, privileging high cocoa productivity and timber, but just one species, using chemical inputs, planning to set irrigation system to tackle increasing drought problem. Very high on economic, but low in terms of environmental outcomes, still meets the goals and the farmer is satisfied. And last example, farmers in Ivory Coast, where a diversified management is centered on forest remnants, natural regeneration and planted tree species performs well in terms of carbon and biodiversity with average level of cocoa productivity, less well on other aspects. So there are multiple options uh, and scaling should focus on promoting them collectively. A system approach, and yeah, I think that we, we all agree now, is, is needed to take into account opportunities and trade-off to design with farmers suitable options that meet negotiated outcomes. So what are the priorities? That's something that has to be negotiated. This is 
a three-pronged approach that consists first of a fine tuning process at the level of a practice in relation to site condition and farmer's profile. It has to be combined with intervention context level to foster condition that makes a practice attractive. For example, access to credit, access to services, to then third, reduce trade-offs and risk associated to a practice for a specific farmer profiles. Unfortunately, it is common to promote best bet option. We have a dream about best bet option and easy solution and few models over a large area. So this is what we mean by scaling, large area, few models. That means that there, there are farmers that are left behind and there is little room for learning. So to respond to that, at ECRAF, we are a research center at the end of the day. We promote a research in development framework that embeds research about option and adoption within development initiative and to support investment uh, um, similarly to the models that we will hear about uh, later this morning. We think this can accelerate learning about what is suitable and where and can support successful scaling. So I'll be happy to talk more about that. And uh, I think time is almost over and thank you very much. Something went wrong in the sequence of the slides. Sorry about that. We, we had a technical issue while I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the technical aspects were not agreeing with me. Um, Valentina, that was great. The apology for that little delay right there. Um, so you just presented very, very effectively just the complexity of different systems and the need for local knowledge and the, the level of, of investment that's required just to understand and to work in the participatory process to develop um, a, a local based, locally, um, relevant um, agroforestry system and how that's a real challenge for driving scale. So now let's talk about what are those factors for to contribute to scaling up successful agroforestry systems and what are those bottlenecks? So with that, I would then like to invite um, Johan from Kinome to, to talk specifically about successful agroforestry systems, how to drive a scalable model and, and how to address some of those key bottlenecks. So Johan, over to you. Thanks very much, Etan. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be with you with, in this panel and, and share um, this uh, work, which is uh, still um, uh, ongoing. Um, so Etan, I, I share my screen, right? Because nope. I cannot see the, the slides. Uh, the slides should be up right now. Can you see the slide? Just to give some um, some word of, of context. Um, so I am Johan Fare. I'm working with uh, Kinome, a French uh, consulting firm. And uh, the work that I will present is um, uh, we are developing this with the World Bank. Um, because we are agreeing, uh, we are in a, at the right moment of uh, uh, implementation of agroforestry at large scales because um, of the, the public policies and, and the, the private initiatives that um, Ethan uh, has uh, listed in introduction. And now this work um, that we are developing with the World Bank is to support the stakeholder on the ground on how to, to, to work better together, how to uh, in fact, it, it is not um, another guide. There is many, many guides on agroforestry, but it is more a list of best practices that can um, help to work together in an integrated way, in a sustainable way, and uh, to have more information of in this uh, south-south knowledge, knowledge exchange, in fact, 
I invite you to, to attend to the presentation that uh, Jean-Dominique Vescon will give tomorrow on the, um, on the panel protecting Amazon with, with cocoa. Johan, can you see the screen? Just let me know when you want me to change slides. Uh, I cannot see the slides, but um, please go to, um, I, can't, I cannot see your screen. Yes, it's okay. Um, Great. Okay, that's good. Thanks, sorry. So um, I have three key messages. The first is what I said before. Uh, we are in, in the right moment uh, to scale up agroforestry projects. Second is that uh, we had on the ground. So th the idea of this guide is to, to, to study uh, some best good practices from, from the ground. So there is success stories. And, and the third message is to, to say that um, uh, the scaling up, the condition of scaling up is to work better together and to address the, the question of uh, living income, for, ex for example. So this first example is um, a small scale project uh, it is one example uh, among other, one success story among other, but uh, with a good multi-stakeholder approach and, and um, that will need to, to, to be scaled up uh, later. It is from Côte d'Ivoire, uh, uh, close to Lame project, Lame Forest. It is a, a Red Plus pilot project developed by, by Sode4, which is the body in charge of uh, forest management and uh, an NGO that has been uh, studied the, the forest to, to identify the high conservation value area. This, this NGO is um, Earthworm, formerly TFT. And uh, another NGO has um, studied the, the most relevant uh, agroforestry models uh, that can address uh, the needs of, uh, of cocoa production for the farmers and also the needs of diversification in terms of timber trees, in terms of fruit trees. And um, they partnered with, uh, with uh, uh, a buyer, which is um, uh, Alter, um, sorry, a, a French uh, company that is buying fair trade and, and organic, uh, organically certified cocoa. And on the top of all of that, they deliver to, to the farmers uh, uh, a payment for ecosystemic service premium based on the amount of, of timber trees and uh, the, the carbon sequestration uh, they calculated on the, on the farm. So uh, it is a real global approach that also addressed the issue of, uh, of tree tenure. For example, they sensitized the farmers with, with the, new, um, the new forest code that uh, allows uh, the farm, those who has planted this, their tree to really um, be the owner of these trees. And they also accompany the, the sanctification of the piece of land where the farmers are. So it is, it is really a, a global approach. But now success stories exist, but we need to, to scale up. So next slide, please. Um, there, there are some opportunities uh, in particularly, and we are studying this country uh, on the, in the context of this guide. The countries involved in, in uh, emission reduction programs, for example, like Ghana, Colombia, Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, in this slide, I present uh, the case of Côte d'Ivoire, um, the, the new forest code uh, with this uh, objective to reach 20% of forest cover in the next uh, decades. Uh, and also with this approach of uh, categorization of, of, of uh, forest classe to to, to, to allow the, 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 the signatory of, of uh, forest concession and, and agroforest concession, for example, for, for private sector uh, in partnership with, uh, with cooperatives of, of uh, timber or cocoa producers. So it really creates, it is creating a, a, an enabling environment to allow uh, those who has tested small scale projects to, to scale up. Uh, and with a, a clear uh, role from, from the public, from the, the public power and also uh, the, the farmers and also the, the, the research that can accompany them and the private that can 
a clearly defined um, a contract approach with, with, with the farmers. So what we need to, to, to enable um, upscaling to work hand by hand, uh, private and public. And, um, and uh, in this case, for example, of Côte d'Ivoire, uh, the, the amount of uh, surface is, is really huge to, to welcome such, um, such a project. Um, second is uh, to, as I said before, to work hand by hand, um, chocolate uh, makers, uh, timber companies, and also the, 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 the farmers. And, and, and third is to, to address this question of, uh, you, you may be aware of the early re uh, results of the um, uh, cocoa barometers, that there is still this need of, uh, of uh, taking into account uh, the, the living income in, in cocoa. And uh, last, uh, last slide, please. Um, so um, this guide is, is that we are uh, designing uh, the ideas of, of this guide, as, as I said before, is not a, a new uh, guide on agroforestry. It is ready to, to accompany you, uh, the, the actors um, um, on cocoa value chain, uh, on how to, to, to design an agroforestry project in the context of Red Plus or CFI, for example, how to build uh, partnerships, how to work with, with smallholder farmers, for example, how to aggregate them, how to uh, monitor um, their environmental performance in terms of carbon sequestration, for example, um, how to monitor their livelihoods, how to channel the finance to, to the cooperatives and, and farmers. And this guide will also um, present some, some tools that has been developed by others on early warning system on deforestation, for example, even in even uh, under canopy deforestation, um, what is the cost of such monitoring? Who should borne the cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And last, it how is how about how to give more value to the products from agroforestry beyond uh, certification uh, of cocoa? Uh, there is some uh, voluntary um, approach that can give more value. There is also um, the, the other standards that are designing uh, new standards on cocoa, like a rainforest, for example, like uh, also for timber trees, the tree outside forest standard, etc., etc. But now, um, last uh, on my end is to say that to do all uh, of that, um, to work together, valorizing social and environmental uh, impacts uh, is not a question of, of know-how. There is more a question of um, anything else uh, beyond that. It is the way about how the partners look the other. Uh, it is about, uh, it is a, a mind sh mindset shift, in fact. And, and what we, we do in Kilome is really to, to accompany the stakeholder in Coco Valley Chain, Vanilla, uh, or, for example, protected area management to, to really build on, on, on a strong uh, shared vision of, uh, of uh, development. Thank you very much. If you have any question, we will have the opportunity to interact. Uh, thank you, Johan. That was great. Um, and reminder to everybody, please um, ask your questions directly into the chat function. Ask your questions here because we'll be Getting to those questions at the end of this, um, uh, these initial presentations. Uh, Johan, I do have a question for you. And this kind of plays back to, to what Valentino was talking about, um, uh, the, the local context. How do, you, how do you envision taking a more of a global guide, global guide of best practice, and then building that link to to local perspectives and really developing a system that is most appropriate for the local environment, local economy, and, and, and the farmer's needs, of course. How, how do you see the guide at the global level connect at the local level for, for practitioners and, and other key stakeholders? Yeah, thank you very much, Etan, for the question. Um, the guide will, will address the, the two levels. First is to, to present, to, to, to give a, a, a uh, an update on all the policies that has been uh, designed, um, that, that has been decided. Uh, 
uh, CFI, um, so red plus policies. And if we, if we talk about Europe, for example, the zero deforestation, zero imported deforestation policy, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we will also in the guide uh, study the, the particular uh, situation of, um, of Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, uh, and, and, and Colombia, which are the, the three countries which are in, in the CFI. So at national level to present the, the enabling condition that each country proposes to propose today. And last is to, to give some um, specific uh, cases uh, in terms of, of, um, of uh, land tenure issues, tree tenure issues when we are in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire or, or Colombia. Um, and the last is to, beyond this, this uh, specific and detailed case of each country, to give more um, a, a checklist of, of good questions to, to be asked uh, to the project promoter before, uh, when in the phase of, of designing the, their project. I think that is some uh, ideas of, of, on how we, we, we expect um, uh, on how we, we, we intend to address this, this issue of a specific context in, in the guide. And some indicators also on, on, on income, on, uh, on uh, food security, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic. We look forward to, to, to getting this guide when it's complete. Um, now we're going to go to, to the private sector perspective. Let me just do a quick sound check. Um, Sebastian, have you been able to effectively connect at this point? Let me just make sure. Yes, I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, Perfectly. Uh, yep, you're there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, now, Sebastian, in, in, um, uh, remind everyone, um, Sebastian Venderhoek is the forest advisor at, at, at Cargill. Um, now, Cargill is a major player in, in, in the cocoa sector, um, and you are already making significant investments to promote cocoa agroforestry. Um, as part of, of the Cocoa and Forest Initiative and, and, and I'm sure beyond that as well. So Sebastian, over to you. Um, how are you integrating innovative solutions um, to develop scalable models for cocoa agroforestry that ultimately make business sense for, for Cargill, for the company? Thanks, uh, thanks for your question, Ethan. Indeed, um, um, in my capacity as forest advisor, I'm working um, in the sustainability team of Cargill, uh, Cargill's Coke and Chocolate business that is part of the uh, wider Cargill and corporate company. Um, to, to tell you a little bit more about why and how we um, uh, invest in agroforestry, I wanted to start with giving you a bit of a global outlook of uh, where we have direct um, cocoa sourcing operations uh, on the ground. Um, this is, uh, in fact, the case in, in five countries, not only in Ivory Coast, Ghana and Cameroon, West Africa, which is uh, by and large uh, um, the most important uh, set of countries where we um, uh, purchase uh, our cocoa through our direct sourcing networks, but also Brazil and, uh, and Indonesia. And um, through our direct um, sourcing networks, we, we purchase our sustainable beans and work uh, with approximately 210,000 uh, farmers on a, on a daily basis. Um, and in these different contexts, uh, we take very different approaches to agroforestry. I think we already heard that uh, there is no one size fits all approach. Um, the reason uh, for why we decide to um, uh, uh, invest in, 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 in agroforestry is that Cargill, as well as our customers, we recognize that uh, cocoa agroforestry has uh, the potential to generate several benefits to farmers and cocoa growing communities and landscapes at large. And when we launched our uh, Protect Our Planet Strategic Action Plan, which is our commitment to addressing and ending deforestation in the cocoa supply chain, we set ambitions for integrating environmental uh, programs into um, our cargo cocoa promise. Um, the, the, the benefits of agroforestry um, um, 
range from from economic benefits um, to um, to livelihood benefits, as we already saw in previous um, um, presentations. But they also radiate uh, more broadly through um, through landscapes and, and forests. Um, and actually, uh, there's mounting evidence that agroforestry is a, is a viable best practice. It's really great to be uh, among experts today that actually underscore that um, um, why it's why it's so important for us to invest in agroforestry is that it also very much has the potential to secure the longevity of the cocoa the cocoa sector. So the question is actually not. If uh, if we need to invest in agroforestry, uh, but more more how? Um, so so let me tell you a little bit more um, about how we how we do this. I already um, talked about the cargo cocoa promise, which is our um, uh, commitment to um, to a thriving cocoa sector, and it's really the vehicle through which we work with farmers um, across the countries that I showed in the previous slide. Um, and um, we, we, we work with, 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 um, with our customers and with, with um, um, global and local partners to implement uh, agroforestry best practices into our supply chain. Very, very fundamental to that is understanding contextual um, elements that uh, can make agroforestry a success or can be barriers to agroforestry. Um, and I'd like to show uh, how, how we do this in the next slide. Um, you see how we have worked to um, map our map our uh, map, map our supply chain and and up to the to the level that we that we know where boundaries of farms are that directly supply our sustainable cocoa. Um, with these um, with these um, um, farm boundary polygons that you see here in orange, we um, we collect a wealth of other information. Um, uh, about the yields that uh, that um, uh, these cocoa farmers are able to produce. Um, obviously, from these polygons, we are able to extrapolate the, the farm size. We also collect information on labor costs, uh, inputs um, that that are used by these farmers um, to um, to, um, to to produce cocoa. And and this data actually is is sort of the basis on which. We um, 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 drive our, our agroforestry programming. It really allows us to prioritize where, where, and how we can invest. Actually, it's very comparable to the uh, um, to to some of the work that uh, Valentina Robillo of uh, of ICROF just showed. We're basically um, establishing a farmer profile, and we also know how this farm interacts within the landscape. So, is it um, closely located to a, a degraded classified forest, for example, that is um, of importance to, to future conservation. So on top of this, we, uh, we then um, design agroforestry uh, solutions. Um, we do this, for example, with partners like uh, Pure Projet or Impactum. And if you go to the next slide, um, um, there is a, a handful of examples of, um, of um, 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 of models that we have promoted um, throughout the past years into our supply chain that very, uh, very much range from boundary plantings um, uh, to facilitate the extraction of timber as trees mature, but they can also be mixed intercrop models um, uh, with fruit tree species um, uh, intercropped across the cocoa farm. And so since this year, we're also more and more promoting full stand reforestation as part of unproductive lands uh, within or, or outside cocoa farms. And, and we actually design these models together with farmers, depending on um, their interest in, in um, uh, diversifying their, 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 way of doing, uh, their way of doing business. Um, and um, actually, these are three models that, uh, that, that farmers have appreciated in Ivory Coast, for example. Um, these models also come with um, um, detailed uh, revenue in, uh, increase projections over a 30 year cycle. And um, what we have done actually recently is, is connecting the dots on the farm maps that I just showed you and all the information that we get on, uh, on costs and, and revenues of farming with agroforestry projections to understand what agroforestry can mean for cocoa farmer household incomes. 
um, uh, over over a longer time uh, horizon. And um, we've worked with Pure Projet, um, UNEP, and um, uh, the European Forest Institute to actually um, couple our insights on how these economic models can uh, can help set a baseline against which we um, we measure uh, how can how agroforestry can actually benefit farmers so from an economic perspective. Uh, this is essential, really, to to um, to design um, new financial solutions to uh, to to make agroforestry work at scale. Um, in the next slide, um, um, just um, bringing this paper um, in which we bring all this work together to your attention. Uh, uh, it will be um, uh, published today, so you can read more about how agroforestry. Um, can work for farmers, how agroforestry, according to our analysis, can uh, raise uh, household level incomes, but also what, what some of the barriers are that we, uh, that we see. And I, I'd like to leave it at that. I'm sure there are many questions and I'm happy to take them on. Hey, thanks, Sebastian, that was great. Um, um, Maybe maybe just a, a quick follow-up question. I mean, you you have a, a significant footprint in in the cocoa sector. Um, and let's just start with West Africa, of course. What what will it take? What are the key bottlenecks and and the the the, the gaps and and really opportunities for um, a company like Cargill to to truly scale up cocoa agroforestry across um your, your entire um value chain let me let me um, um list four uh, four four key gaps um i think a very interesting takeaway uh, from the study of uh, mrs nieder and, and jacoby is actually um that in order to do their research there was only one um, eligible or suitable paper that that they could include on benefits of agroforestry in ivory coast so um, while there is a lot of um, knowledge uh, being generated across the globe around agroforestry and cocoa agroforestry specifically, uh, there appears to be fairly limited information still on the benefits of agroforestry uh, in cocoa and in West Africa, Ivory Coast specifically, particularly uh, as to how agroforestry may or may not affect um, cocoa productivity. So, um, um, sharing of, of information, data and knowledge and, and doing further research uh, is, is key. Uh, then, then more in terms of practical implementation, some of the key barriers we, we come across when we, um, when we implement programs with, for example, Pure Projet are uh, access to quality inputs. Uh, so uh, uh, seeds and seedlings. Um, um, another uh, key barrier is, is land and tree tenure that um, uh, is now uh, uh, luckily being um, further integrated in new forest, uh, forest law and regulation in West Africa, but it still requires institutionalization and, um, and there's a, a huge amount of awareness raising across all actors needed to, to make sure that we understand how farmers can actually grow and own uh, trees on their farms in the long term. The last, um, the last and key barrier, I would say, there is an, a tremendous need to actually um, 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 build um, um, scalable markets uh, for agroforestry products. A farmer can only generate additional revenue from agroforestry if the farmer is able to actually accrue the benefits uh, that agroforestry uh, um, um, uh, can 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 have so think of um, uh, the sustainable harvesting of timber or the sustainable harvesting and offsetting of fruits into into local and international markets. Um, there's opportunities out there, uh, and we're uh, we're building on those uh, through our through our work. Uh, but this is some, something that really requires um, attention. No, and maybe just one quick follow up to that. Um, you know, I, I know that, that that you are working on on kind of the the the, the best practices around forestry and, and, and agroforestry at Cargill. To what degree are you able to 
considering your your wide um, value chain um, within the cocoa sector, maybe even other products, within Cargill itself, to what degree are you able to take learnings and best practices from one geography or from one commodity and bring it over to, to other geographies and commodities within Cargill? It's a really interesting question. Um, um, you still hear me? Yeah. It's a really interesting question, actually. In in um, uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, where we also have direct sourcing operations, uh, agroforestry is um, is for for some time already um, really um, um, institutionalized and integrated in local uh, in local regulation. For example, around mandatory restoration of degraded farmlands. So cocoa agroforestry uh, and, and cocoa as a, a native species to the Amazon biome is, is gaining a, a lot of popularity in, in regions such as Para uh, to help facilitate um, uh, regulatory compliance and restoration of degraded cattle rangelands. Um, so actually um, um, it makes a lot of sense in, in, in Brazil to, uh, to uh, invest in, uh, in, in uh, cocoa agroforestry and it, it serves really as a win-win opportunity. Um, these are very interesting examples um, that um, I think uh, countries um, uh, such as Ivory Coast and, and Ghana can, uh, can, uh, can learn from. Fantastic, thank you, Sebastian. Um, Andrian, over to you. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, you do not achieve sustainable agroforestry systems by planting a tree today and then just hoping for the best tomorrow. I mean, agroforestry truly requires long-term investment in terms of time and money. How is Ecotierra pioneering innovative finance to develop and scale agroforestry systems? Thank you, Ethan. Um, yeah, so Ecoterra uh, started working about 10 years ago um, with various partners to develop and operate uh, agroforestry projects. And the founders had been working for 10 years prior to that with various co-ops to form them, help them export their products, help them um, attain certification, etc. And the creation of our fund, the Irapi Sustainable Land Use Fund, was really born out of um, the limits they saw to certification schemes in terms of the potential to increase um, or improve farmers' livelihoods, and also their frustration about so many projects and interventions being short-term, three, four, five years if you're, if you're lucky. Um, so they wanted to work longer term with co-ops and also develop this untapped opportunity they saw to increase uh, both in, in one shot, like to improve farmers' livelihoods and also have significant positive environmental outcomes. So next slide, please. Um, that opportunity they saw uh, was to transform producers' degraded land into agroforestry systems. Um, the regions where we initially worked in, in uh, Northern Peru, um, fe like featured a lot of producers that had, on one hand, a couple of hectares of aging coffee and cocoa systems, one or two hectares of degraded pasture land, and then perhaps one hectare of standing forests. So the opportunity that we wanted to develop was really to transform these degraded lands into agroforestry systems. Um, okay, next slide, please. And as I said, to really work uh, with co-ops, with farmers over 15 years, um, to really make sure that all the, the potential had was developed and that we built the sustainable change uh, uh, with them. Um, so the fund is expected to reach $50 million by the end of this year. Uh, we had our first closing of 32 million and are in the process of finalizing the raising of uh, the additional 18 million. With that, we will invest into four to five agroforestry projects in Latin America. Um, and uh, next slide, please. The, and how we do that. 
And how do we manage to generate uh, a return for our investors, but also make it viable for producers? And a big component of the answer is that we package several activities and revenue streams within the fund um, so that we diversify the risk, um, well, diversify the revenue streams to reduce the risk. And, um, and yeah, and so that creates, um, uh, that really reduces the risk for the investors. But also that's what I wanted to say is that each of the components, each of the four activities really reinforce each other. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So obviously the main activity and source of revenue is financing land use transition. So that's lending money to co-ops who then lend to their members uh, and it's patient credit. So three to four years, which is really necessary to be able to get agroforestry off the ground and often completely unavailable in these regions um, at well below market rates. But of course, uh, we still charge an interest rate to be able to generate a, a revenue for the fund. Um, so the farmers can use that to either renovate aging farms to avoid the need to clear land elsewhere or uh, restore degraded pastures into agroforestry systems. Um, we have, uh, we build carbon projects around that, VCS certified, um, and the cooperatives use their share to finance technical assistance to help us ensure that the farmers are successful in that transition over their long term, and therefore that increases their chances of, of being able to pay back their loans. We also invest into supply chain infrastructure. Uh, so mills, um, collection centers, uh, biofertilizer plants, um, uh, because for example, in the, re the featured project on this slide in Colombia, uh, the lack of uh, organic fertilizer was a barrier to growing organic production in the region. Uh, so we invest in that. That creates a revenue also for the fund, but also helps farmers uh, get be able to develop higher quality products for the market uh, and get a higher price, therefore also increases their ability to repay the initial loan. And then we have a small sales team um, that sells the commodities to buyer and aims to generate added value for the producers given all of the project's impacts. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, I'll go over very, very quickly, but this is just to show that, um, this is an example with coffee, by the way, not cocoa, but um, it's just to show that uh, we work with farmers to gradually do this transition. Uh, it doesn't have, and it shouldn't happen all at once, right? So we'll often uh, encourage them to go towards, well, that, the initial idea was to encourage them to go to the, the hector that could bring um, the most financial benefits in terms for example, on this slide, um, restoring the degraded land into agroforestry. But we found that farmers are actually more comfortable starting with uh, the other hectares. So like, for example, full sun or half sun systems that need renovating that will help them bring that into agroforestry. And then once they get comfortable with their ability to repay the loans, then we can go and, and, and convince them to um, restore the, the fully degraded land into agroforestry. Uh, next slide, please. So what are our challenges? Um, there's many and, uh, and to scale up, there's many and you're all, you'll be familiar with many of those, but maybe I'll focus on the two first ones. Um, so we work through cooperatives and we need cooperatives that have good governance, good leadership, some some level of business acumen that are can see this opportunity and that are not afraid to take it on. And um, of course it is a challenge because we're bringing a new kind of business component to, the, to their day-to-day -day activities. We're bringing in, they're not used to lending money to their members to transition to agroforestry. So, it takes a lot of work, um, discussions, capacity building, et cetera, et cetera, but to get them to really embed that into their business model. 
Um, and so simply building the pipeline of cooperatives, because as we know, it's a minority of farmers that are members of, of cooperatives. So building the, the, the pipeline of able cooperatives for groups like us to invest in would definitely be, help us and others uh, scale up. And then um, price, I mean, uh, obtaining fair price for cocoa and, and for the impacts and the extra effort that these producers and co-ops are putting in, even if it's a small percentage, would really have a positive domino effect as it, it would help us recruit additional producers, additional co-ops um, to join projects such as ours they would see a tangible commercial benefit as well. And the others, I mean, are, are, are classic challenges so that you're well familiar with. So open to questions. Adrian, um, who, are, who are the key partners that, that you work with and kind of what are the roles and responsibilities? That's a great question. So one key differentiating factor, I would say for Rappi is that we don't accept proposals for us to invest in. We actually always co-develop the projects and investments with the co-ops. And that takes a long time. It can take as, on average, it takes two years from let's say the first meeting with a co-op to the investment, you know, hitting the bank accounts. Um, so the, our main partners are co-ops and they become joint owners of the joint ventures uh, from the get-go. And in our exit strategy, the 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 first the they have the option to be the first buyer of all the project components as we exit. So, for example, all of the infrastructure that we invest in, they can gradually buy our shares throughout the years. So they're really our core partners, and then we work, uh, you know, uh, with 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 some companies and you know, institutional investors to reduce the, our risk and the risk for co-ops. But the co-ops are our core partners. Fantastic. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is invite everybody to, I'd like to invite everybody to um, open up your um, your video so we can have a little bit of some some interactive um, Q and A and that that includes the speakers and I believe the participants can um, use video as well if you choose to um, uh, Onisim if if you if you need to enable something please do exactly that um, thank you. Um, panelists, um, everyone, for, for the, the, the great presentations. And we've had some questions come in so far. Um, before I get started, I invite um, all of you to click directly on the chat, ask your questions here to, to send more questions our way um, for the panelists now. Let, you know, what, one of the panelists that, that we had hoped to have today that, that ultimately um, 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 was not able to participate was somebody from the public sector, somebody from the government in particular, um, somebody from the Conseil du Café Cacao, and to talk about the, um, the, the, the work being done nationally in Côte d'Ivoire to, to promote cocoa agroforestry. But, but I, I think we, we, it would still be fruitful for us to get to a little bit of a dialogue about what are those enabling conditions from the governments, from, from the public sector in order to help drive um, further investment in, in cocoa agroforestry. And maybe I'll ask this question um, first to Sebastian to take it from kind of the private sector perspective, what's needed in terms of the enabling environment. Um, Valentina, I'm sorry, not Valentina, um, uh, Andrian from the investor perspective. And then from um, Johan, if you could talk a bit about what your research has shown, especially as it's integrated into, you know, alignment with, with national Red Plus platforms and, and um, how, how to really drive and scale agroforestry. 
So Sebastian, maybe over to you first. Um, you know, what, what are those enabling conditions that, that you need or that Cargill needs, that industry needs in order to, to spark investment? Thanks. Um, um, we talked about uh, enabling conditions a bit already, uh, but I'd like to um, um, highlight, highlight one that we've really um, um, come across into our day-to-day uh, -day work in implementing agroforestry in Ivory Coast, um, the piece around um, tenure and, and rights, um, in, in especially in, in certain areas in Ivory Coast, there is still a, a vibrant um, timber industry interacting with cocoa farmers and other small farmers in the landscape. And, um, before the, the revision of the forest code in, in Ivory Coast um, um, last year, there was, there was somewhat of a, um, um, a conflict between, um, um, uh, say, uh, uh, land, land operators and, and, and timber industry. So um, we spoke to a lot of farmers that experienced uh, the, the negative um, elements of having trees on their farms. Um, also very much rooted into um, um, uh, perception of, of, um, of, the, of, of what happened in the past years, where, where farmers encountered their farms destroyed by, by, um, by, um, by um, timber being logged by, by private um, timber industries. So, so the incentive to, to have trees on, on farms was, was actually limited. And, and if, you, if you travel to West Ivory Coast, you, you might see trees on farms actually uh, being, being burned off um, because farmers don't have the tools uh, to actually uh, uh, um, um, uh, either in a sustainable way make use of these trees and they face, they face sort of the, the risks of having a tree on their farm. Uh, um, uh, and, and in interaction with, um, with timber industry. So I think uh, one important barrier that, that a government can help resolve is clarifying rights around trees and, and land uh, for farmers to, to be able uh, to, to actually uh, see the value of investing in, in, in managing trees on their farms um, and, and have trust that they can actually uh, um, gain, gain benefits out of that. And, um, and this is already happening. Uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Johan Fare also mentioned that um, rights uh, around trees uh, on farms are being clarified as part of the new forest code. Now uh, a big wave of institutionalization is, is required to actually make this uh, a reality across the country. And Duran, um, from, from the investor perspective, what are you looking for um, from the public sector to, to spark investment? Um, yeah, I mean, very general, and this is not specific to developing agroforestry, but you know, reduction in bureaucracy and time delays, for example, for, to, uh, to clarify land tenure for, for individuals. For example, the project I featured in, in Colombia is in a region where there, used, there was some conflict for, during um, the Colombian conflict and, and that has impacted you know, land tenure for some of the actors. Some people left and want to come back, et cetera. And the process, the legal and bureaucratic process for them to clarify and legalize their tenure is quite, is very lengthy and, and an obstacle in some cases. So just to simplify that, but that's easy to say and I and like the hopeful thinking. Um, but uh, you know, uh, with regards to the carbon angle, the, um, of course come some some level of stability in terms of, of, of the rules in there. So we invest in developing projects for the voluntary markets, but are not assured that um, our credits will still be eligible in five years from now, et cetera, et cetera. So providing some level of, of, of certainty around that would be helpful. Um, and then as I alluded to earlier, helping us um, get farmers or co-ops investment ready for in private investors such as ourselves and others to be able to inject funds um, is something that we are not able to do as a, as a small private investor. 
So that's where um, public programs and fund can help as well. Uh, the, 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 let's build on the carbon um, because I, I believe that Johan, from from you, um, you've you've taken a, a bit of a look at at um, national red plus programs and and how to link that with with agroforestry. Um, anything that that you want to pull in from from your your studies so far? Yeah, thank you, Ethan. Um, first is to to really confirm what uh, Mr. Sebastian has said just before, that when, um, when the rules of the game are clear, uh, for example, when, when the farmers in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, are in a gray zone or they, they don't know if they can or they cannot do this or that to plant cocoa in this area or to, to have trees to be secure, etc., uh, it is difficult for them to really have ownership of our industry. And then they will we will not have an impact on the red plus programs because they will because those who will the scale, who will operate the scale up are the millions of the farmers because they are the first actors on the ground so if we we can really get them in in, in the game it will be really a, a wonderful journey but if they are in the in the in a gray zone they, they cannot really accelerate the process for example when when this new forest code has been published from this time it it it, it is clear that uh, in in the category of forest that uh, the degradation rate is uh, higher than 90 percent okay there will be the possibility of developing this or that kind of project there but the rule is clear from this moment for example the also the decree or, or law on the on the on the tree tenure also created um uh, and ownership because from this time, the farmers are really uh, uh, confirmed that, that, that they will be the owner of, of the, the tree they, they plant, et cetera, et cetera. And second is to, to really have tools, access to tools. For example, um, the, the NGO I mentioned in, in the case, uh, they developed these tools of um, basal area as a key indicator of, of the performance of uh, of agroforestry systems, um, the basal area of the timber trees, for example. So uh, uh, from this time, um, the, the monitoring of, of the farms in, in, in the context of red plate will, will not depend of, on the accounting of each tree in the farm, et cetera, et cetera. But from remote sensing technology, et cetera, it will be easier to, to monitor. Uh, and last is to, to create value. Um, in this study, we will uh, do a comparative approach, Latin America and uh, Africa, to understand why in some countries, <clears throat> the increase of production is based on a, 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 an increase of yields and why in other countries it is based uh, on uh, deforestation. Uh, maybe it is because of the capacity of investment of the farmer, so there is a need in this uh, in these uh, environmental projects to, to really address, not to see just the tree and, and the carbon, but to really address the income of, of the farmers to allow them to invest more. Um, let me actually use that to then transition to a question over to Valentina. Valentina, um, you, you can develop the most beautiful locally based agroforestry model. Um, uh, that's most appropriate for, for, for that farmer, for that region, for, for that environment. But at the end of the day, you really have to, it's really up to the farmer to adopt and not just adopt in the short term, but, but in the long term. What, what have you found on the ground and on the ground experience are those kind of key drivers that, that help to catalyze, facilitate farmer adoption of, of cocoa agroforestry? or agroforestry in general. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. That's, uh, that's a very crucial question. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, first of all, many farmers already do agroforestry. And it's just that we think that they have to adopt something that is designed and that fits certain purposes, but actually, we very often do an exercise with farmers asking them to recognize the trees they already have in place. And there are so many already 
that according to a definition of agroforestry, it's still there, it's already there. So we, 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 we have to understand probably uh, it's not always adoption, it might be a transition to a more, uh, let's say efficient system or a more performance system. So that, that's, that's, uh, that, that, that is one, one part of the answer. Um, the, I think that it's important to understand livelihoods. It's important to understand livelihoods goals. And it's important to understand um, the perception of the risk. What we see is that in general, sm smallholders tend to diversify and then diversify through agroforestry, but they also diversify at the farm level. So you might have highly specialized farmers, let's say in Cote d'Ivoire or in Ghana, but for example, in Peru, farmers might have cocoa, they might have annual crops, they might have pastures. So depending, and, and that's a very important strategy that can then generate some trade-offs and, and can also uh, bring in some implication about what to prioritize and what you do in one, like, uh, I don't know, if you support the adoption of silver pastoral system or if you put too many standards on, on livestock, then farmers might shift to another, to another, another system. So, it's important to understand the risk perception in terms of livelihoods and in terms of the long, long-term condition. Yesterday, I was talking to someone who is paying to farmers its coffee, 12 soles per kilo. It's the double of what farmers get. And these farmers do permaculture and apply agroecological principle. And they get a very high productivity medicinal plant, it's, it's a lot of things that we have decided to study these cases, but it's a long-term engagement from the enterprise. It's a long-term engagement along the value chain to de-risk the farmers, because of course we have to make it attractive for the farmers to adopt it, but it also means that risk has to be spread along the value chain and costs as well. So that's also something that it's, it's very important. So farmers who are ready to, to adopt or shift or, or, or undertake a transition are farmers who get a guarantee. Very often is not an issue of knowledge, is an issue of getting guarantees about, about the future and the commitment of the enterprises. And actually I was asking Sebastian when, when I was going to ask him wh what really, does he think that farmers need from the enterprise? To, you, you, um, um, Cargo as an enterprise? Yeah, um, no, no, not an enterprise, but from, from, from the private sector or from a company that... Right, yeah, I, can, I can speak to, um, to how we've tried to tackle some of those risks um, uh, as part of our program. So, so uh, within our supply chain, um, uh, we take more of an holistic approach, sort of acknowledging that, that agroforestry is, is about far more than uh, just getting trees to the farmer and, and, and sort of uh, complementing that with training programs on how to, um, how to plant that tree. One of the ways we, we de-risk, so to say, is to, to link um, incentive payments to positive survival rates that have been achieved uh, in the first um, three to five years of their establishment. Also really to sort of cover that, um, that, um, that, that gap or, or per perhaps that perceived gap around uh, need for additional uh, labor investment. Um, and we're also, we're also trying to capture and to cover some of those risks by, by integrating uh, support for, for um, 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 obtaining tree tenure or land tenure, as well as the establishment of, of market linkages from the early stages on. Um, so those are some of the examples that we work through to, to, to de-risk, let's say, but it is true that some of those, those risks are, are uh, way beyond what, what a company like Cargill can achieve. Um, uh, one example is um, the example of interactions with the timber industry where now very interesting uh, concepts are emerging where actually timber industries get involved in 
um, um, sort of signing of agreements around offtake of timber. Um, um, but but uh, other other risks uh, like like climate risks uh, uh, are are indeed more difficult to uh, to capture. But but those are some of the ways that 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 we operate today to um, to to take away or to try to take away some of those those risks. And of course, on the on the cocoa side, um, um, we work through long term partnerships with with cooperative organizations. Uh, and supporting supporting those organizations and their members with uh, with with services that go beyond uh, agroforestry, let's say. Um, but that's um, also part of a clear uh, commitment. Um, I'll actually plug there. There there is another um, panel conversation. I think it's happening right now, but the recording will be available specifically on. Um, uh, impacting or, or helping to to drive farmer adoption of, of best practices in in climate smart cocoa of which um agroforestry is the key piece so so we, you can listen to that recording later on um joanna and, and vipka um at the end of the day we want to get a sense of of just how how much we're making progress with regards to the development and promotion of cocoa agroforestry. But certainly what we found difficult within the Cocoa and Forest Initiative is coming up with, with a, a standard definition of cocoa agroforestry, especially one that is quantifiable, is extremely complicated. Um, from, from your meta-analysis, from your studies, what, what how have you seen and, or how are you defining cocoa agroforestry and, and how can you help us tackle the, this, this question? Okay, I think I start. Um, this was exactly our question in the beginning of the meta study. How can we uh, separate um, or how can we define what is an agroforestry system? What do we compare to the monoculture? And in the end, we we said for, for our group of researchers, we say, okay, we will say any agroforestry systems has an influence, even if it's just one monospecific shade tree or is it a huge diversity of, uh, of agroforestry systems might be have an influence uh, in comparison to a pure only cocoa monoculture. And so we, we com combined all agroforestry system, anything that has trees on it and was defined in this publications we found as an agroforestry systems. And here we really um, got agroforestry systems with just some, um, some uh, trees and some that were really highly diverse with different strata. And we made an, um, a supplementary information for our research that shows this. But I can understand that this is really difficult for anyone who wants to define it. Um, not only in cocoa agroforestry systems, we have the same in, in Germany for implementing agroforestry systems here, that there is no, no, no definitions and that's why farmers do not implement it in a right way. Um, maybe Johanna can add something. Yeah, one conclusion we can draw from that and more important maybe than norms and this is using principles of uh, yeah agroecological principles that Valentina mentioned and look at each context if those principles that are available online and all the agroecological research if these are taken into account I mean some of those are biodiversity density and many others and we have to look uh, every time if those principles are followed or not more than implementing norms like I saw something like 15 tree species per hectare. That is nothing in some contexts, might be a lot in other contexts, but it just maybe not doesn't make so much sense. So I would really say, look at agroecological principles. That would be really a progress. Johan, anything from, from um, your research and the development of the guidance that can help um, also bring better, better clarity to this question? Um, no, um, nothing specific to add, uh, just to say that <laughs> it is yes, I know. It is to say that um, um, there is a, a large panel of agroforestry and um, 
systems and each specific context should uh, choose uh, an acceptable scheme. There is uh, some interesting papers on the, on the trade off between, uh, between more agriculture or more uh, 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 agroforestry or but uh, there is some some key indicators on on the forest on the uh, timber tree on the trees cover or, or on the agroforestry plot, for example, uh, on the uh, trade off on uh, carbon sequestration, trade off on biodiversity versus cocoa production, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it 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 can in, it can be interesting to to select some. Um, relevant indicators and, and relevant um, uh, proxies um, to, to design uh, an acceptable uh, agroforestry system. I think it will be difficult to have one system for many countries, but there is some key indicators that people can, can really decide. <clears throat> we, we, we have permission to go over by another few minutes. So I'm just gonna ask one last question um, and, and then we'll wrap up. But um, the, the last question is, in, in for, for the promotion of cocoa agroforestry, it's not just about taking degraded barren land and establishing an agroforestry system. A lot of it, maybe even the majority of it really has to do with the promotion or the conversion of cocoa monocrops to an agroforestry system, which I, I would believe on the ground would be an extremely difficult um, uh, process to, to, to move forward, especially with regards to working with farmers to, to make that transition. So, so what, what have you seen to be the key barriers to transitioning from cocoa monocrops to a more diversified cocoa agroforestry system? Maybe Sebastian, um, a couple of thoughts from you real quick. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think um, what I'd like to stress is that uh, uh, more and more uh, evidence is, is, is uh, coming our way showing that agroforestry uh, can outcompete uh, monocultures um, uh, on, on a range of uh, Elements, as also evidenced by, by the paper that we heard about earlier, but also, uh, um, for example, through through the study that we did with the European Forest Institute, um, UNEP and Pure Project, another one, one for twenty partnership, um, really showing that there is there is great potential for for agroforestry to yield um, income benefits at the household level. Um, um, so so. It is possible. You're asking about um, barriers, and uh, yeah, we addressed a number of them already. Um, um, uh, tenure uh, and, and 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 rights, um, quality inputs, and also um, uh, awareness raising and sensitization around the benefits. Taking farmers along in that journey of how how agroforestry may, may be able to benefit them on the on the mid to long term. Um, I think those are uh, critical elements. Um, and then maybe just quickly over to Andrian. I mean, when you're working with the cooperatives in, in developing, I think you said it took about two years to develop an actual management plan. I'm assuming a lot of that has to do with the conversion to, to cocoa agroforestry. How, how does that play out from the investor perspective? Yeah. Um, um, well, I'll just start by saying that um, the Irapi Fund focuses on Latin America, and we are well aware that the situation in West Africa is, is quite different. For example, a lot of the producers don't have the amount of degraded land I, I, I talked about earlier, and that the challenge is, as you said, uh, converting aging full sun farms into agroforestry systems. Um, so the Irapi Fund uh, cannot invest in Africa. However, we do have a team that works in Cote d'Ivoire uh, with CEMOA to implement agroforestry systems um, with uh, their farm, the, their suppliers. And you know, my, you know, my colleagues tell me that uh, the bar the main barrier is that 
uh, when they, you, they're struggling to live month to month, they cannot make the investment without assurances of being able to pay it back. Uh, you know, and it's 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 a long term investment. So we need to crack the how, how to make that capital available on terms that are acceptable for farmers that are living barely above the poverty line. Um, so 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 yeah, that's what it boils down to, according to my colleagues that are are working on the ground there. Great. Thank you very much. Um, with that. Just so that we have a, a, a minute just to wrap up. Let me just see if I can share this. Great. Um, I, 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 truly, I truly want to thank everybody for, for um, your participation in, in the panel today. For our speakers, Valentina, Johan, Sebastian, Andrian, Vivka, Joanna, for all of the um, um, participants and, and the great questions that that you are feeding our way. I, I hope we got to the majority of them. Um, certainly, if you if you have additional questions, you can always feed them to us, um, and and we'd be happy to 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 share. Um, and and I, I truly believe that that you know, this dialogue and dialogues like this will really help us to to further demystify. This, this question about cocoa agroforestry and how to develop sustainable and, and scalable models um, for the cocoa sector in West Africa, but then ideally um, beyond. So with that, thank you all very much. Note that, that the next session will be in not too long. Um, you, you can see on your agenda um, and Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day and, and participation in the partnership meeting. Goodbye. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> <Not> funny. <laughs>